um, the reason why I've put the QEG bit as in the title as well is because uh, neurofeedback um, as an intervention has been around for many years, but it's only really in the last decade that it has been informed by an, a particular assessment called a quantitative EEG, EEG being enso, uh, encephalogram, you know, EEG in, in brain activity recording. Um, and it's very important in my view as a neurofeedback therapist, practitioner, whatever you want to call me, um, that we do inform our practice via a QEG assessment. There are some neurofeedback practitioners who would disagree with that and would still use what I call the old method of just doing neurofeedback without the assessment, but I strongly believe it's important. Um, that cap there has 20 electrodes, which is the minimum you can get away with across the scalp. As you can see, it's spread across the, the head. Um, each of those electrodes has a wire that comes out the top, and that wire is then connected to this sort of machine. There's many like it, but that kind of machine. Um, which enables us to pick up the electric signal that's coming off the surface of the cortex. But of course we can't pick up that signal just from an electrode which is sat in a cap. It doesn't, it do, uh, we do need to insert some uh, conductive gel. And we do that using a syringe with a blunt needle into the hat. Uh, there's little holes in these dots here where you can insert the gel. So you can imagine, is anyone sat here at the moment thinking, the person I know with ADHD is not going to sit still long enough to enable me to go around. <coughs> hey, good man, he's probably sitting there. You sitting there? Yeah. Okay. Well, believe me, uh, it's incredible <coughs> what we get away with in this kind of setting that parents don't feel that would ever be possible. I don't know why it is. It's obviously just the, 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 the setup that we have. It's going to the office. You know, it's a different kind of schema that someone has about it. Um, but we do get away with it. But I won't deny, there has been the odd occasion where I've been sort of running around the room kind of like this, trying to get hold of, hold of the, the cap, as it were, and put the gel in. Um, but it does work, it can be done. Um, once the hat is on the head, uh, as I explained earlier, we record the brain activity just when they're sat nice and relaxed, as far as they can be, given they've got a hat on the head, uh, in the room, uh, on a chair, just at rest, with their hands on the lap. And we record with their brain, uh, with their eyes closed and their eyes open for one minute alternate uh, you know, alternately for a total of only 10 minutes. So we only need 10 minutes of recording and in actual fact we only really need two minutes worth of good quality brain activity data. Um, 10 minutes we record for because we have to filter out things like eye blinks, uh, lots of other interference that comes into play, muscle movements and all sorts of things. Um, so 10 minutes we find is a good, good amount to get us the two minutes. Um, the hat had those electrodes, a standard kind of approach. So there's a standard, uh, it's called the 1020 system. Um, there's a standard kind of formula which is used to place the electrodes within a cap. Okay, um, and it's, you can see the maps there. So for example, this location here is called Z CZ. And that's the one right on top of your head. Okay, so when you do neurofeedback, um, it's important to understand this kind of idea because the electrode has to be placed at a specific location according to the data that you found in the assessment. So it might be that we put the electrode at CZ, because that's where we found a dysregulation in that person's brain activity, for example. So it's, a it's not just a case of picking a point when you were on that person's head, it's a standard sort of approach according to the setup of the electrodes. <coughs> this is uh, just a screenshot of someone's brain activity with the 20 channels, so the 20 different electrodes there, different lines going across the screen. Um, that's the raw data. So that's what we would then filter. Um, we then analyze it, interpret it, write a report and so on. Um, but that's what we sort of look at on the screen. But having filtered it and analyzed it, this is the kind of uh, presentation, if you like, of the findings that we provide. And we call these brain maps for obvious reason. Um, but you can see that in this particular case, we separated each of the different sorts of brain activities out. So the very fast brain activity that I'm probably producing a lot of right now is beta. There's the alpha one, theta and delta, that's a very slow one again. The way to interpret the colouring is that if it's green, then you would suggest that it's falling within the norm. So let's just use those ph phraseology for now, it's a little bit crude, but let's say that's normal, okay? If you see oranges and reds, then that's too much of something. Light blues, dark blues, that would suggest there's too little of some sort of brain activity, okay? So you can see that when interpreting this sort of information, it's very important to understand the previous sort of few slides that I, that I showed you in terms of how does brain activity and level of arousal, um, how does that link, if you like, to the person's presentation and their symptoms and so on. 
does it make sense? Does a profile where you've got a little bit of orangey here, a little bit of orangey there, some red there, does that make sense in relation to how that individual presents from a behavioral perspective? <clears throat> this is why I think QEGs are so important in not only identifying the physiological correlates for behavior, but also particularly for identifying how you move forward with neurofeedback. If, if you don't have this information and you only have clinical symptoms listed, if you like, or rated or whatever, um, then you are not sure that by changing someone's brain activity you are directly trying to then, or indirectly, but through the direct measure, trying to change their behaviour. If you've got this association, if you can see their brain activity, and you can say, yes, this person has too many theta wave brain waves in the frontal regions, which I know is suggestive, or is what we tend to see in people with impulsivity, executive function problems, and so on, and you've got that, and this person does seem to have it, or it does seem to suggest there are those issues, then you can go forward with some confidence that if I try and target and change that brain activity, I'm likely to try and also impact on their behavior. If you don't have that link, then we don't go for, we don't suggest neurofeedback is, is a good course of, uh, course of action. Of course, it doesn't happen very often, because that's the whole point. If it did, then QEGs wouldn't be useful. So 99% of patients, you do find a good, a good association. There might be, uh, you know, probably in around about 20% of cases, there's some pattern of activity which you're looking at thinking, I can't really understand why this high beta presents like this, but that, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, so there's elements always, often which do make sense, but there might be in 20% of cases some part of it which doesn't make particular sense to us. From a practical perspective, you have something recording your EEG, uh, so you have some sensors on your head, and that's picking up your brain activity, your EEG signal, which is fed to a computer screen. Um, and it can be fed in, in a, a very basic way, so the individual can be sat watching a game. Uh, or playing a game, I should say, or watching a video. Um, it can also have a speaker element to it, so there can be an auditory sort of tone signal or something. Um, so in other words, this is the feedback to the individual. They're watching something and they're listening to something, which is giving them information about what their EEG is doing, their brain activity is doing. So you can see this individual here's got some sensors on his head and he's looking at a screen which is giving him some information. Equally, this guy is doing the same. The point of the game and the, and the um, tone is that, of course, that's their information about what they should or shouldn't be doing. So if they're doing the right things, if they're producing the activity we want them to be producing, the game plays, they score points, or the tone sounds loudly, if that's what it's all about. And whatever it is, it's giving them the information that, yes, you're doing the right thing, you're producing the right brain activity that we need you to be producing. We know you need to be producing it because of the assessment we did, we identified that you had not enough of it, for example. Yeah. So that's the feedback to them. Obviously there's another screen which I'm looking at, which is that a little, lot more complicated in terms of it's the raw EEG, um, so I can see what's going on from the actual brain activity we're recording at the moment. But that doesn't make sense to a lot of people, so it's more, more fun, certainly, for the individual to be sat playing a game or something, isn't it, rather than them just seeing their brainwave going across the screen. So that's the idea. Of course the principle then is just the same as the cats. If they're rewarded for producing that activity time and time and time again, then they're more likely to produce more of it in general. And indeed, that's what we see. So one example could be Pac-Man. So, needs a button to be clicked. Oh, well, we'll have a go at this in a minute with someone, but effectively, if the person was producing the activity that we want them to be producing, Pac-Man runs across the screen, he eats the food, he scores points, and yes, you're doing well. Um, if he doesn't move, if he stutters or stops, then you're not producing the activity we need you to produce. So clearly you need to try and understand how it is you, you, that you feel at that time when it's not working as it were, and then do something different perhaps, and try and get it running and learn from that. And it's keep calm, focused and relaxed. So if you try to do those three things, you will often, uh, often produce the sort of brain activity that you would were you to meditate. Um, and that those three things are used because that often is a good place for your brain to be as it were, in terms of the activity it will be producing, and it will often help produce what we want it to be producing, even though everyone's dysregulation is slightly different. Okay? Uh, the reason why we only use those three words is because it's very different for each individual in terms of the actual sort of thing they do, and I say that loosely, do, or how they feel. Um, you know, it's not like thinking about drinking a cup of tea and all of a sudden you produce alpha activity. It doesn't work like that, obviously. So it's not a concrete thing. Um, so it's just a prompt. So first, first point. What we're doing when we're recording EEG is we're picking up the electricity which is giving off the surface of the brain. It's given off because of the chemistry in the brain and the electrochemicals that are fired, if you like, between the neurons, okay? 
and certainly on the surface of the brain there's called pyramidal neurons where you pick this electricity up quite well. And it's a good indicator of what's going on below, but obviously the further away you get, the less of a good indicator it is. Um, so, in other words, when you're, if you like, trying to achieve a better regulated brain, by that I mean one which is producing the levels of activity that we would expect to be seeing in someone who's functioning well, um, what you're doing is changing that electrochemistry, and therefore you're changing the neural pathways in terms of their effectiveness of communicating within, it, within themselves, but also to each other. The way that neurofeedback works, unfortunately, is a bit of a trial and error basis. So the average number of sessions that people have with us is 40 sessions. So it's not a quick fix, you can see that. It takes a lot of time because of that conditioning element. It takes a long time. Once we get to the point where the person's brain activity, let's just call it theta for now, has improved perhaps, but then begins to plateau, um, we always say to that individual, and this is from clinical experience from doing it for 10 or so years, um, do another 10 sessions at the similar rate that you're doing now um, to, if you like, ingrain the learning that the brain is taken on. Normally it doesn't improve from that. During that 10 sessions it just carries on plateauing at the level that you've achieved. Uh, and if you like, everyone has a sort of, appears to have this sort of ceiling so even if they haven't achieved, achieved the level that would be deemed to be normal, they've improved, but to the point at which they can improve to at that moment in their time and being and so on. Okay? If you do that, so if you do enough sessions that you sort of really ingrain that learning, we find it's long-lasting. Okay? If you don't, as it were, and in some cases anyway, um, you know, there might be then a regression of symptoms, in which case we suggest people come back and just have a few more, maybe another month of doing sessions, mm -hmm to get it back up to that where we were before. Um, but So it's a trial and error in terms of when you end, and of course there's all sorts of things that, that are involved in, understand, in trying to understand it, including time, cost, and so on. So I can, there's always that sort of, oh, we don't really want to carry on now, blah, blah, blah. It's always tricky. Um, but in terms of us theoretically understanding what we're doing via the neurofeedback, we think it is a long-lasting effect. Um, but I say think, and I'm being quite sort of about it, because at the end of the day, I'm going to be honest with you, no one's done a sort of 30-year outcome study with 10,000 patients who've done neurofeedback. Um, it's not so much as too new, because it's been around since the 1960s. It's impossible, to dif to, even if you were to do that, to be able to differentiate down and say, yes, it's because of the neurofeedback. Because life happens. If you, the way I describe it is this kind of thing. If you imagine that you're the person in the middle of these circles, forget what's on the circle. If that's me and I've got all sorts of things around me which make me me, including prenatally, the birth, what happened to me at birth, and everything else around me, my social support, my genes, blah, blah, blah. What we don't know. It's impossible for us to say which one of these circles, if you like, is making a more significant contribution than the others. They will all be contributing, but to what extent, we don't really know. Now, if you've done neurofeedback, what you're trying to do by doing neurofeedback, or anything else, exercise or anything, is to try and make um, the risk factor of any one of these things um, meaning I experience a negative life consequence as less. You're reducing that risk. So you're trying to, trying to get yourself to a point where if life happens in a negative way, you had a car accident or whatever, some negative life thing happened, you'd be able to cope that much better because all your circles are optimum. Do you see what I mean? So that's what you're trying to do with neurofeedback to the brain. You're trying to make it optimum so that that person is more resistant to anything else that might happen as they go forward. It doesn't mean to say they won't suffer, it just means that you're getting that circle in a good place. When we do the assessment, we like them to be off medication, but when they're doing the training, they can be on the medication. Because if you imagine, that the reason for that is this, that medication clearly affects your brain activity, that's absolutely right, but if, if without medication my level, just, I'm going to talk loosely here, but just imagine my level of activity is down here, okay, and we want it to be up there. With medication, it gets a little way to it perhaps, okay. But an assessment, we know that we've got to increase it. It just means that when you do the neurofeedback, your baseline is starting here instead of down here. You've still got to increase it, yeah? Because when you take the medication away, it drops back down. So the principle of the conditioning is still the same. It's just that the person's brain activity they're producing will be slightly affected by the medication they're, they're taking at that time. Um, just in terms of how neurofeedback works, and there's two ways of doing it. One is coming to the clinic, and I've given you some information for your own information about this, because it's obviously some, you know, how much is a good question, right? So that's why it's on the slide. Um, people come to the clinic for regular sessions, um, and that's fine. That, that, that can work, of course, very well, but we always say they've got to really try and come for two a week. If it gets down to one a week, then you'll just be there so long that you'll probably want to give up before you've got to the end, to be perfectly honest. Um, but we also offer a distance training uh, package, whereby people go away with pieces of kit that look exactly like this in some instances, uh, very similar in others, 
Um, they have these gels. Um, we install software on their laptop um, and we instruct them how to use the kit. It's a step-by-step -step guide. It's not, not sort of rocket science. And they do the sessions themselves, whether it be in the school, so teachers take, on, take it on, uh, the workplace, we've had HR people taking it on, um, and, and of course themselves. Um, they then send us the data. So they do the session, they do this sort of technical aspect bit, putting the electrodes on the head, and then they record the data and send it to us. We review that data in real time, so I sit and watch it as if I'm sort of in the clinic with the person, and then we work together in changing any of the settings in the, in the software and so on. This is not as good as that if you were to do the sessions exactly at the same time of the week uh, and the number of sessions exactly the same time. But most people pick this because they can do more sessions. Coming back to your point, sir, if, you are, if I'm able, because I have it at home, it's more convenient to me to do five sessions a week. Actually, overall, I'm going to be better off than doing one or two a week doing that. So this is the, you're, you're observing me, hopefully, and what you're seeing is exactly what you would need to do in a neurofeedback session were you to be the person at home doing it. Okay, now this third electrode is going to go on your head and then we're going to stick it just on top of your head. I'm obviously just arbitrarily picking a location here. We haven't done a QEG. Okay. Now Cameron, um, what three words did I use earlier? Can you remember? Keep calm. Was it keep calm? Um, Good. Focus. Refocus. And relax. So relax, focus, and keep calm, okay? They're the things that I want you to try and do. And what I want you to do is to try and keep nice and calm, nice and relaxed, nice and focused, and keep him running as quickly as you can. When he is running nice and fast, I want you to carry on just feeling like you are. If you see that he stops or stutters, try to keep calm, focused, and relaxed again, all right? And we're gonna walk away around the maze, and we're gonna see how quickly you can do it, all right? If you get it under two minutes, 20 seconds, that'll be a very good day, all right? Let's see if we go. So I'm gonna click new game now. flyer didn't you okay he was running really smoothly so you were obviously pretty chilled at that point then come across a bit of an obstacle did you feel any different at all at that point or did you not feel any different not really no okay but then for whatever reason your brain then started producing sort of a relaxed type of activity again and started running again okay classic comment here from Cameron didn't really feel I was doing anything it's the first time he's ever done it anybody who does that including yourselves would be sat there thinking I don't know what I'm doing takes a few sessions before adults begin to sort of think, yeah, I might be manipulating this and controlling this, okay? I wouldn't expect Cameron to after probably about 10 sessions at least. Okay, but that's the sort of practical aspect of it. You can see what's involved. Obviously that was just one minute, one minute 42. What did I say, two minutes 20? Yeah. That's good. Star. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yes, yeah, so that's the sort of practical aspect of it. And obviously that's only sort of one minute, a couple of minutes there. You would do that for around about 10 minutes and then you'd move the electrode probably to a different location, depending on what the QEG assessment told us, um, and do some more for another 10 minutes or so, and then probably move it again. There's normally three or four different locations we'd want to train in any one session uh, for 10 minutes or so each.